All right, you ready? Reggie Redbird, your name is known around the world for determination, drive, and your fighting spirit. You see, whether on a game court or a playing field, Reggie takes his job as ISU's number one fan very seriously. It's this passion for ISU that has driven generations of Reggie's family to cheer the loudest, dance the hardest, and be the biggest ISU fan in the world. But at home, you're a down-to-earth bird who likes nothing more than to be in the company of 20,000 of your closest friends. Were it not for your ancestors and a little help from some ISU legends, you might not have become the world-famous bird you are today. Reggie Redbird, this is your story, the backstory of the bird. Where the music plays, folks. I'm going to promise you that was a really amazing intro. <laughs> I'll, I'll send it to you, is that okay? Awesome. All right, I'll email it to you. So, pedagogues, fighting teachers, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to talk about these things today. Reggie Redbird, the backstory of the bird. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Though the university was founded in 1857, it took a few decades for Reggie's ancestors to make a nest on campus. In the early days, the campus had a longer name, Illinois State Normal University. The word normal meant that the university was a teaching school. Students who attended ISNU in those days were going to school with one purpose, to become teachers, like Reggie. <laughs> Athletics were considered a recreational activity and came second to studies. I know! Well, it was 1800s, man. I know, I know. But when the students played sports, they played them well. Numerous sports were played on the quad by all students, including football, baseball, track and field, and women's field hockey. <laughs> the students took great pride in their educational pursuits, and so they took the letter N from the word normal in the school's name and used it as their team logo. So that was our first logo. The letter N began appearing on team jerseys, pennants, and student attire. They also started calling themselves the Pedagogues. As you can see in this, it's coming up, April 19th, 1916 Vedette headline about a track and field meet. So we were first called the Pedagogues. Of course you're wondering what in the world is a pedagogue? Do you know what one is ready? Okay, I'm gonna tell you, you ready? All right, a pedagogue is short for a term known as pedagogy, which means the art or science of teaching. Or, put another way, it's the philosophy behind educational techniques. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I have a couple of degrees. All right. <laughs> While the name did describe the students of the time, it certainly did not strike heart into the fear of competitors. And it wasn't really a very good name, was it? No, kind of, no, kind of stuff. So, at the turn of the century, students started calling themselves the fighting teachers. <laughs> Both the students and the community use this phrase. Oh. <laughs> but it says wow on the on the screen. Fighting teachers, wow. I mean they must have liked it at that point. Hey. Well we're getting to you, we're getting to you, don't worry, we're getting to you. Hey, you got a granddad and a great granddad, we're getting to you. <laughs> Both students in the community use this phrase to describe the students and the athletes at ISU well into the 1920s. So, by the 1920s, though the school already had colors, red and white, we had red and white by that time, the school did still, at that point, did not have an official mascot. I know! We had not chosen a mascot. So, as you can see up there, on that 1921, the index, which is our yearbook, the school referred to itself as the red and white. Oh my god. I'm going to kill Reggie today. <laughs> calm your feathers, calm your feathers. <laughs> All right, okay, we're getting there, we're getting to you. All right. <laughs> but the new athletic director, Clifford Pop Horton, does Horton sound familiar to you? Do we know Horton? Horton Fieldhouse? Yeah, that guy. Yeah, 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 Horton, yeah, Horton Fieldhouse. 
When Pop arrived on campus in 1923, he started calling his ISU and U sports teams the Cardinals. Okay, we're getting there, we're getting there, the Cardinals, after the school colors. He didn't think of red so much as red, but thought of red as the color cardinal. And that's why he liked the Cardinals. He said, oh, I'm skipping ahead, but that it made sense at the time. Yeah. It's kind of windy out here today. Are you going to go flying off? All right, all right. <laughs> Hang tight. <laughs> no other school in Illinois had our colors, and we were red and white. So, and a bird, let's face it, makes a much better mascot, doesn't it? Yeah, that's right. As Pop tells it, Brick Young. <laughs> Brick Young at the Panagraph pointed out that there was no other team nearby that used the Cardinal as their mascot, except for, do we know what it is? Who used the Cardinal as a mascot? <laughs> I like this guy. <laughs> so, of course, we couldn't be the Cardinals. <laughs> there would be too much, too much going on, too many people fighting one another to be a Cardinal. So, Reggie, it was around this time that your great-grandparents moved to campus. Yes, finally! Your great-grandparents moved to campus. They nested in the bell tower of the oldest building on campus at the time, Old Main. Your family, your great-grandparents, were looking for a community that they could call home. And the students on campus, they didn't know who these people, these birds, they didn't know who these birds were. Were they here to just make a nest or maybe be faculty and teach students the finer points of nest building? They weren't sure. So your great-grandparents attended all the school games, all the plays, all the graduations. They wanted to show the students that they supported the school and would always be here to cheer on their newfound home. Reggie, your great-grandparents arrived at the perfect time. The local papers were looking for alternative names to for Cardinal, so they decided to try out a new name that would honor your family, the Red Birds. Yes! <laughs> in fact, we've got a photo, I'm gonna hand you one, it's in here. We put some family photos out of Reggie's scrapbook. Here is your great-grandfather, uh, a very regal bird, if you ask me. <laughs> well, look, you know, photographs of the day. <laughs> so, the new name, the Redbirds, was a hit, and we officially had the Redbirds on campus. We want to preserve this. I know, I'm going to take very good care of it in the archives. All right, I know, I know, it's really old. I got you, don't worry, I got you back. I got you better. As Pop put it, there was no trouble <laughs> over dropping the name teachers. In fact, the fact of the matter is, I never heard a word about it, Pop said. Everybody accepted the change. I thought it was right, Pop said about the name change. Pop was really only talking about the students, though, because the newspapers and the student publications, they all started going back and forth. I know, they couldn't pick between Cardinals or Redbirds. And on the screen there, you can see we've got a mixture. Some people said Cardinal and some people said Redbirds. Nobody could make their mind up for several years, but the Unix used both the names Cardinals and the Redbirds describe, to describe the ISME students. <laughs> student athletic groups also took on the Cardinal name, including an elite group of students who were part of the Letterman group known as the N Club. In fact, we have a patch. Can you hand me that patch, please? Now, this is archival. Be careful. Be careful. There you go. Be careful. Do you know? How much I'm going to charge you when you break that? <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. You can hold it. Just be very careful. There you go. Here, I'm going to turn it around. There you go. I'm just giving you a break. You can play with it. There you go. Do you know what it took to get that patch? I'm going to tell you. To be a Cardinal, athletes had to achieve a, a high number of citations and awards were elected to several club offices, had to complete 10 athletic goals, including eight out of 10 free throws, run two miles in 15 minutes, and write a dissertation on either basketball or football rules. Could you do that? Yeah, I figure you're a way stronger bird than I am. <laughs> two miles in 15 minutes isn't happening. <laughs> so you know how you wore that? Put it on 
the chest. Oh, fine, whatever. Somebody's got to be different. <laughs> so, all of the terms previously used to describe ISME students, including cardinals, no, 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 you got to wear like a, like clocks, you know. <laughs> I watch each one. <laughs> Here, hold it, hold it for me. Uh, all the students, including Cardinals, was dropped after World War II, and we officially became known as the Redbirds after World War II. In time, the word Redbird went to Redbird. We then became Redbirds. Reggie, your family didn't mind all of the name changes because they had much more important work ahead of them. So, for the next 60 years, 60 years, your family embraced their place as the university's number one fan. Three generations of birds showed their feathers to an excited student body. Don't fall off. <laughs> <laughs> Students loved their Redbird mascot and used the Redbird likeness for numerous events like homecoming, Founders Day, school dances, student shows, and anywhere they could find an excuse to use the Redbird plumage. Homecoming, of course, as we know, is an extremely popular event, and they would use the image anywhere they could and was used in house decorating contests and parade floats. Let me show you this one. Another family photo. This one. Someone's getting handsy today. Careful, it's archival. <laughs> Do you know how old that photo is? What, how, where that's from? 19, five, yes, five, six, seven. 1957, yes. That photo is from 1957 and we were imitating or putting up images of the Redbird in 1957. So, all those photos that you see playing on the screen are actually family photos from the early 1950s to the late 1960s of the Redbird image, which, as you can see on some of those photos, more successful than others. And I have another one, which should be coming up here on the screen as well. One of my favorites, Reggie's grandfather on a boat, captain of the boat. It's pretty awesome. At least your granddad was captain of his own ship. Uh, again, that whole successful more than others, it's paper mache, but you do what you can, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, it was the 50s. But that's granddad for you. And are we up yet? This 1966 photo on the screen, and I'm going to hand one to you, shows, hold on a second, here we go. This is a really old one, too a photo of your grandfather with Dr. Bone and his wife, Karen. So that is your grandfather. There <laughs> uh, we go. As you can see in some of these early family photos, the Redbird mascot family loved marching in the parade, cheering with the cheerleaders, maybe a little too much into the chagrin of Mrs. Redbird. A little bit, yeah. And perhaps getting a little too close to the homecoming bonfire like that photo in the top right corner shows. Reggie got a little too close and maybe singed himself a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I know, just a little bit. A little, little feather burning. Ooh. Someone's on fire today. <laughs> I know. The more the Redbird family participated in events, the more the students embraced them as part of the ISU family. So actually, some of you may have noticed in these photos we've been showing, when a new one comes up, some of you may have noticed that how a uh, family has changed their look over time. And let's go to the next one. That's Reggie's great-grandfather again. You can see how clean cut and refined he was. Uh, he set the bar for later mascots to follow. And then the next one, that one again is Dr. Bone with Reggie Redbird. Now we have a story about your grandfather. We were told at the archives that he was a bit of a trickster, that he was known to play tricks on Dr. Bone. See that photo over there, it's coming up. He's on a camel, Dr. Bone is. One homecoming, Dr. Bone, who had recently gone to Egypt and learned how to ride camels, came back and suddenly the idea came about that they were going to leave the homecoming parade with a camel. And then it was decided that Dr. Bone would be the one to ride the camel. So they convinced the president of the university to leave the homecoming for 
for you writing the candle. Mr. Bone, or Dr. Bone, was known as being a very dapper dresser. He would wear a bow tie and a suit to every football game. You don't see a man like that riding the camel very often. Except for maybe you. Yeah, that's right. So your grandfather, while we can't confirm or deny it, we think your grandfather was the one who was involved that got him on top of that camel. And I think that picture's proof enough. Well, look, history doesn't, we, we just prove things. It's fine. Okay, okay, we'll keep it quiet. We'll keep it quiet. Can we change the picture so we don't? Yeah, sorry, we'll keep it quiet. <laughs> So, as we've seen, your father is an extremely enthusiastic mascot. One game, he purportedly lost some feathers on the basketball floor. He got so excited, but it's okay. Everybody has that parent. I know, I know. So, <laughs> oh, dad. This is a picture of your dad from the 1970s when he was going through his disco phase. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now, I don't know if you know this, but before you hatched, your family moved around a couple of times on campus. You do know this? Do you know where they moved? Well, we're gonna show you. Okay, you ready? So they moved from Old Main, which is coming up again. There's Old Main, so they were in the Bell Tower. Then they went to McCormick, down the way. Then they went to Wharton Fieldhouse, Pop Wharton, and now where you are, in Redbird Arena. That's right, they moved to Redbird Arena. And here is the good, good part when you were hatched. Yeah, so Reggie was hatched in 1981. It was a super exciting time on campus in 1981 because we had this newly hatched Redbird and he was to be given an official name by the Junior Redbird Club, something that your parents, your grandparents, and your great-grandparents never had a name. Do you know where your name came from? Yeah. Your name? You. Well, of course, you. You were named for Reggie Jackson, the baseball player. That's the Junior Red Club kids named you, Reggie, for Reggie Jackson, which I think he's right there. And there's you. And actually, the photo for you, too, that is a photo from your very first photo shoot. Do you remember that? Yeah? And there's another photo of you from your photo shoot. There you go. I know. The dapper bird that he is. Yeah. Your very first photo shoot. <laughs> oh man, these article photos are just not going to last in this weather. I tell you, I know, I'm a terrible artist. that's okay. So, after some training and a few pointers from your family, Reggie was ready for the spotlight. So, for those of you who are not there that historic day, Reggie made his public debut at the Illinois Wesleyan ISU football game on September 5th, 1981. You were nervous, right? A little nervous, maybe? I mean, they did have you in a box, on a field, on a flatbed, surrounded by cheerleaders. That's got to be nerve-wracking. Okay, right. we'll just, we'll say a little bit. So, he was in a box, on a flatbed trailer, surrounded by some well-placed balloons and cheerleaders. And when he got the signal, he was to jump out of the box and introduce himself to the crowd. On the signal. Not yet, yeah. <laughs> on the signal. You were both excited and nervous. Would the ISU fans like their new mascot? Could you live up to your Redbird family legacy? Of course he was. On the signal, Reggie jumped out of the box and into the school history. The cheerleaders surrounded him and the crowd burst into applause. <laughs> yeah, crowd burst into applause. See, Reggie didn't have anything to worry about. The stadium went wild and they loved you. The torch that day was officially passed your great-grandparents, grandparents, and parents, and you became the official mascot of Illinois State University. And after your debut, your popularity immediately soared. Yeah, and let me tell you how much your popularity soared. You were asked to numerous events, including ribbon cuttings, hanging out with celebrity chefs. Well, I could be a celebrity chef. <laughs> I could be a celebrity archivist. Helping to open the new McDonald's in the student union. Uh-huh. And chatting up the clientele of a new locally placed grocery store. You were in so high demand and became so famous that you had to recruit a team to help you manage your appearances and events. I know, you were a really busy bird. But even with that level of stardom, you have remained down to earth 
Over the years, you have worked steadily to build your media empire and become a media mogul. You see, Reggie insists that he manage his own social media accounts, including Pinterest, Facebook, and Twitter. And I talk to him often on Twitter. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, you got to talk about your family on Twitter. It's great. That's right. You're the No, you're the bird. You're the bird. Have no, you. No, you. 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 Okay. <laughs> Reggie, your roots on campus are almost a century old. In those 100 years, your family has shown us how to be the biggest ISU fans. You've shown us how to be proud Redbirds and participate in bettering our community. You embody your family's values and you commit your full energy and effort to being ISU's best mascot. From his smallest Redbird fans to his alumni and student faithful, Reggie Redbird shows us what it means to be ISU proud. Reggie, you have come full circle and completed what your great-grandparents set out to do 100 years ago. Be Illinois State University's number one fan. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for letting us tell your story, Reggie. I think that's the first time that we've actually been able to fully tell your story in full. I know, and showed some photos that have never been seen before, I have to add. Those photos that you saw were some of the first time that we've been able to bring those photos out of the archives and make them available to the public. So those haven't been seen since the 60s and 70s. Yeah, so you're gonna, you need to come by and visit us. We'll give you some more stuff. All right, thank you everybody.